Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming at you live from episode 118 of Life on the Rocks with your host, Connor LaRock. Today's featured guest in the hot seat is Joe Drago. Joe, how are you today? Great, great, Connor. Thanks very much for inviting me. Anytime. It, this is this is past due. Me and Joe have been waiting to do an interview for uh, quite some time. For anybody in the city of Greater Sudbury who doesn't know Joe, um, he was the former chair of Hockey Canada. This gentleman right now currently is the president of Foyer Inner City Homes, so a local charity we work with uh, here in the community. To start this off, get the conversation rolling. Uh, what got you started in your career, my friend? Well, my career was, uh, I actually, Connor, I probably had four careers because I didn't know what I was doing half the time. But I, I went to Clarkson University on a hockey scholarship. And when I graduated, in my graduating year, I had planned to either try to pursue a career in hockey or to go to law school. And uh, my coach from Sudbury at the time was going to uh, get involved in building a school in Sturgeon Falls, and he called me and said, would you like to come and help me uh, start a hockey program and, and teach? I had a degree in business, was getting a degree in business, and wanted me to teach math and accounting. So uh, I was on the verge of getting married, which didn't impress my uh, wife-to-be to go to Sturgeon Falls. Right. But anyway, we both decided we were going to go there, and we stayed for five years. So after I left Sturgeon, I uh, got a call to come to Sudbury, uh, Jim Smith called me to see if I was interested in coming to LaSalle Secondary School to head up a guidance department, and I did that. Uh, and I was here a short time, went to Chelmsford, and at Christmas time, the principal at Chelmsford uh, was hired to build Nickel District. Okay. So I was jolly on the spot. I became a principal at a very young age, and that was my, my educational career. But in the meantime, I was coaching high school hockey, and uh, having some success and Bud Burke was in the process of buying the Niagara Falls Flyers to move them to Sudbury okay. and he called me to go to lunch with him and Barry McKenzie who I didn't know personally but Barry was with Canada's national team with Father Bauer and Bud was hiring him as to be the coach and manager and he asked me if I'd join the, the group and become the director of operations and coach the Cubs their uh, junior B team. No kidding. <clears throat> and I did that and the, the following year Bud asked me if I become the general manager, and uh, I spent 17 years with the Wolves, and, and Barry was the coach, and we just had a 1976. They haven't had a team like that yet, but uh, it was just a fantastic run. Probably. We had some bad years, and uh, of course, you know, in, in sport, you're a hero when you win, and you're a bum when you lose, and right. uh, we've been both heroes and bums. <laughs> How was it? Like like at that time, too, hockey was like real, it was more raw. You could go out there, and you got the goons out yeah, there, and it was yeah. probably a lot of fun. But fast forward now to that, you know, being a former pre or a former chair of Hockey Canada, how did that come to be? Well, I took a year off. My wife and I took a year off and we traveled. And I, on the conclusion of our, our trip, we were pulling into our driveway and uh, a fellow that coached me in uh, Midget came into my driveway and he said uh, he was involved with the local junior league and they were having some real serious problems. And he asked me if I'd, and that was the day I just got home, if I'd come to a meeting and give them some guidance and mentorship. So I went to the meeting and it was obvious that they were in a state of, they didn't know what they were doing and the league was fledging. Uh, players from Sudbury were leaving to go south. Nobody wanted to play here. The league was like slap shot, et cetera. So I decided uh, with Johnny, that my former coach, that maybe we could restructure the thing. They didn't have a commissioner. They just had a bunch of guys that yelled and screamed at each other <laughs> at meetings. So I, I became the first commissioner of the Northern Ontario Junior Hockey League. And we went for expansion. We brought in Timmins. We brought in Ruan. We brought in Poisson. And, and the league started to have some credibility. While I was the commissioner, it was very obvious that our league was not really respected and not really treated civilly by Southern Ontario. So I started to attend the OHF meetings as an observer because I didn't belong to the NOHA or any member partner and I was really a, a call in the wind. But I sat in there as a, uh, an observer for the whole year. Dr. Al Morris was the president of the OHF and he knew me from junior hockey and he ran a junior team himself. So he said to me, you should be coming to these meetings as, as a voting member. I said, well, I, I don't belong to any association and I, I'm not eligible to run for a position. Well, he had uh, an amendment at the annual meeting that would permit me to run and I ran for junior council and was okay. elected. And from there, I proceeded through the OHF to uh, first vice president. And then I was the president for six years. And, and all those years, I was a member of Hockey Canada. 
It's wild. So at Hockey Canada, again, I had guys say, why don't you run for an executive position? So I ran for the executive vice, and then I ran for the president, or the chairman, they call him. Totally. So, or go ahead. In, in total, I had about, with OHF and everything else, I spent 20 years with Hockey Canada. It's and wild. I, you know, it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. I traveled all over the world. I met Unreal. all the top guys in the in the game, in the international game, and uh, to this day I keep in touch with a lot of them. What would you say, Joe, would be, you know, some of the things you noticed from some of the top guys in the game, like what were some of the traits they had or some of the secrets that, that you noticed in them? Obviously, you know, working with some of the best, you start to pick, figure or see different patterns in them. Like what are, what are some of the things that these people did or that you noticed that kind of left a mark uh, working there? Well, you know, the, the thing that really made me feel good about our game was the World Juniors, first of all. That was my first uh, baptismal that I tra right. traveled yeah. with the World Junior team. That's fun. And when, you, when you're when you with guys like Crosby and uh, Connor McDavid and, and, you, and you get to eat and sleep and talk and uh, do things together and you see the passion in them and they're, they're playing for their country, then going to the Olympic teams, and these guys are so committed to, to Canada and you know they'd pay you to play on the team. We we had guys that would call and, and were annoyed that they weren't invited to try out because right. you can only have so many guys on the team. Totally. But, and there's so many super duper stars. But when you go in the dressing room after a, a victory, uh, a gold medal game, and you see those guys and they're so happy and they're so proud that they represent Canada, uh, it just makes you. Uh, you know, I stood on the ice for many games wow. to get gold medals. And I'll tell you, your heart just fluctuates when you see that flag going up in the national anthem played. It, it makes you proud that you're involved. So I truly enjoyed that. And, and my wife was alive at the time, and she traveled with me all the time. So it, it was a great, great way to go. And wow. this, this morning I had a, a text from Scott uh, Smith. He's a second in command at Hockey County. He said, I'm just interviewing a guy for a coaching job. And uh, he told me that uh, you had this tremendous uh, influence on him as a junior when he played for the Wolves. So Wild. it's nice to hear those things. It is, especially when it comes full circle like that. I mean, you've done so much and then getting around those athletes. Do you have a moment that uh, in your career specifically that you sit back and it was it was probably one of the best working with those athletes? Like, was it the Olympics? Was it, um, you know, you know, playing in Europe? Like, what, do you have, what, what would be one of those moments where you sat back and you're like, wow, this is, this is incredible. I made it, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I thought... Well, I, when Connor McDavid came onto the World Juniors, I was so impressed with him as a player, but also as a kid. And his parents were there the whole time we were in Russia, so I got to spend a lot of time with them. And uh, you know, to this day, I keep in touch with uh, Connor's dad. Right. And now I'm, I tell everybody. That Sudbury was such a big influence that he's going to marry a girl from Sudbury. Totally, yeah, yeah. no, no, 100%. <laughs> anyway, that team, to see Connor, and and I, I don't hesitate to say that I think he's the best hockey player that I've ever seen. Right. And, and, and they say, well, Gretzky. I say, he's better than Gretzky. Right. Because not only is he a terrific player, he's strong, and you don't push him around. Like Gretzky always had somebody guarding him. Right. And I mean, he, he was a sniper. And, and a great hockey player, but Connor's all around. I've never seen a guy that can shift gears and be in full flight in two strides or one and a half strides. And he's got moves that uh, you, you wonder where the heck they come from. Totally. And and he's just a tremendous person. So that team, it was so nice to to have that ability. And and at the time, Russia was it was pretty tense there because of the Putin. Remember the night he came, right. the opening night he came to the game. They had a thousand soldiers around the building, and you know. It, we couldn't do anything but play hockey that's and, it, and yeah. mind our business. Yeah, so oh, that's pretty. But it awesome. was wonderful. Eh? So I enjoyed that. And then when you start going to the World Championships, you got all the best athletes in hockey there, with their families. And Hockey right. Canada does a wonderful job treating the the families and the players. And they don't get paid. They're there playing because they want to play for Canada. Totally different. And then, I, I, and then my other experience that I really loved was getting involved with the female game. Right. And, you know, I saw very quickly, Connor, how our female team and programs were not fair. Right. The guys were living like kings and treated right. like kings, and the gals were really second rate. Right. So by traveling with them, I saw how these girls 
were darn good hockey players. I said to them, if they cut the pigtail off the back, you'd think they were guys skating up and down the ice. Yeah, yeah. And they shot as well as, as a lot of the guys. Right. So I was very pushy at Hockey Canada that we should be giving more money and, and being more involved with the female game. And again, Sudbury, Jennifer, Tessa. I mean, right. we've got them right here in our own town. So it was really very, very important uh, that the girl, the ladies' game improved, and it, it, it's first rate now. I mean, uh, I love watching them play, and especially right. when they beat the pants off the U.S., I just love that, it. That's the best, too. Yeah, you get involved. <laughs> yeah. And hockey's a good community, too, right? So oh, it brings yeah. everyone in. Well, you know what? I always say hockey's not a sport. It's a disease. Right. Because when, when you're in... I sit now, thanks to the Wolves giving me a nice seat in the yeah, lifetime, yeah. I sit there and watch these people around me. They're fanatics. I mean, right. they, yeah. they, they want to jump up and over the glass when there's something they don't like. But it, it's, a, it's a great game. You see juniors. I always felt, that, boy, if I had a son, this is the way to grow up. Right. You learn how to work with people, how to be a team player, and how to know what is right and what is wrong, and uh, it's it's just wonderful. What would you recommend to the younger generation, so these up-and-comers that want to, you know, be professionals, they might want to be, you know, make the NHL, and then maybe some of them aren't cut out for it too, they might not be good enough. Like, what would your advice be to that younger generation looking at these stars, trying to make their way up through the ranks, just in life and in hockey as well? Well, you know, when I was at the OHL, Sherry Bassett and I talked a lot about scholarships and keeping kids in junior hockey because those that wanted an education, like Dave Taylor, I say Dave, I remember going to talk to Dave, he's a kid from Lavac, and his dad was convinced that he was going to be a hockey player, but he was going to get an education, and rightly so. So the OHL and the Canadian Junior League now have a program that kids can consider because I think there are different avenues for different people. Some kids need school, some kids don't need school as much. Right. But uh, I say you have to have both if you can. Totally. And yeah. now the days are over where they don't look at players here or there. They look at players. There. If you're a hockey player, they look at you. They know all about you. So if you're destined to play junior and you want to play junior, you can do that and you can get your education paid. If, if you want to go the American route the way I did and get all your education paid and graduate, that's great awesome. too. So... Uh, I think, as I said, you pick the avenue that suits you and, and you develop yourself. But the contacts I was able to make through hockey have been really Not tremendous cool. for me personally. I, I mean, I do a lot of charity work, and my contacts are really the key for, for the charity being successful because I call Connor, I, I need this here, my buddy, can you do this for me? You never say no. And, of course. And, and my, I always say I've never been shut out. I go for a donation. I know I'm going to come out of that room with something. I might right. go in asking for ten thousand. I might come out with a hundred, but I always come out with something. Right. Sudbury has been fantastic for charities, and they just everything is successful that you try here. It's it's huge too for the audience out there, Joe. You're probably one of the best connectors I've ever had in my life. I always go in there for the audience listening. To, I, I, Joe is one of the best that work in the room. That you're you're always out there. Like, what would your advice be to people to? to be able to connect more and be able to have an impact. Because as you see, like you said, you have that Rolodex where you're talking to people, hey, can you help me out, or here, things like that. Like, There's a lot of people in the audience that, that they might be scared to, to put themselves out there or try to ask for things. What would you recommend? Well, I, I think the first thing is you have to like people, and you have to feel positive about people. Right. You know, there are a lot of jackasses in the world, <laughs> and I, I know a lot of them, and, they, and a lot of them might think I'm a jackass, but there's more good people, and... I, I like to wander around. Like if I'm in the arena, I would like to talk to people. So totally. I, I go out. I remember my first job as a principal. My boss said to me, you know what your role is? Make sure everything's done, but you don't do anything, but be visible. Right. And, you know, he said, you don't even need an office. Right. And so in school, I was walking the halls all the time, talking to kids, talking to teachers, talking to janitors, talking to the ladies in the right. cafeteria. You know, one of my staff members, a friend of mine, always said, you should work at Walmart. <laughs> yeah, 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 you got fun. Yeah, work in the room, go and see yeah. everybody. But I think it's important that, that not only the, you're visible, but that you show that you appreciate people. Uh, you know, a little thank you note or a little visit goes miles. This morning, again, uh, a, a fellow in Lively called me and said, uh, geez, you called the gal in Sturgeon Falls that her uh, grandson 
is a friend of mine out here in Lively, right. and he told me that uh, she was so pleased that you called. I hadn't seen this woman for years, but at the inner city home, her granddaughter is a volunteer. So she came up to me, she says, you know my grandmother. So she told me her name. I said, oh my God, I haven't seen her. Give me your phone number. So I called her and we chatted for a long time. I love and, it. And then today, then J Jiggy from uh, Lively, he tells right. me uh, this. she was so pleased that you called her. But I, I didn't call her. I like people and I like to talk to people. So it's important. But I think it's most important that you say thank you and you show appreciation. Our volunteers, you, you know, we couldn't survive without volunteers. We only have one person paid at the inner city home. Right. The whole board is volunteers. The volunteers are volunteers. And we're there for the betterment of the people that need help. Needy people, needy children. And that's what that's it's true. all about. I want to talk to you about that. So that's something really good. That so obviously you got to appreciate people. Always show your appreciation. But I think a big part too of if is getting involved in the community and giving back. Talk about how that's benefited your career. You're you're a giver. Every time I see you again, whether you're working the room or you're talking to people, you're giving. You're out there to, to have an impact. What would you What would you say like in regards to to how that's kind of played a, a vital role in your career? Being able to give back. Well, I I think. When you, when you do certain things, you develop a group. Like, I have a, a social group from school. Right. I have a different group from hockey. I have a different group from Hockey Canada. So you make so many different contacts that, you know, I go through my contact list on my computer and I say, uh, well, what do I, I need something? Well, gee, there's uh, Billy. I'll call Billy. And that's what you do. And, right. you know... This uh, last fundraising venture we had, like a guy like Perry DeLise and uh, Mike Doyle Chrysler, they come through to, as sponsors to kick off the campaign. Totally. And, and then their people jump on board. Your people, you, you spread our gospel all the time. So the people sure. that know you say, well, God, if, if Connor LaRock is involved with that group, they must be a solid group. I'm going to give them something or I'm right. going to help them. Right, you know, and it it just snowballs. And it does. I think the whole key is, you have to be trusted that people think you're legitimate. For sure, the authenticity, and I think right now, Joe, you see the online sphere. That's where a lot of the divides coming because you see all these influencers and people online. You're like, are they legit? Do they have a credible background? Things like that. What would you recommend to people nowadays? Because again, you've seen it too, where all of a sudden now everything's on the cell phone. So so through generations. What would you recommend uh, to the younger generation to kind of build that credibility and that trust uh, with, with this crazy time we're in right now? Well, I, I'm a bit critical of the younger generation because of technology. Totally. I think we're becoming so technology-minded that we don't realize they're people. Totally. You know, I like, <laughs> I go out and people are on the cell phone. You're having dinner and they're on the cell phone. Uh, you're driving and you see the car next to you yeah. on the cell phone. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I would say, uh, I don't want a doctor that's on the cell phone. I want a doctor that is a person. Totally. And then I can talk to him and chat with him. Uh, you try to call any company and uh, you're talking to... The machine. Machine. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're a very important customer. Where you're next on line and you're yeah. sitting there and sitting there. So I think the younger generation do not volunteer as much as they should. It's true. And they're so wrapped up in technology that they, they don't even realize that they should volunteer. Like, I, I miss so many meals at home. I miss so many birthdays and events because you're doing things as a volunteer when right. these things come up. Well, I, I look at my own family and families that I know. Their children and grandchildren are so involved, and they are so involved with them being involved that they don't think they have time to volunteer right so it's it's a new world and uh, the volunteers is not only at the inner city home but everywhere they're older people and now with covid i you know at the inner city home we had about 140 uh, volunteers i think this morning they told me we're down to 39 okay. it's not because they're unhappy it's because they're nervous and worried about covid what's going they, on they don't want to come out you know we're we're planning an uh volunteer appreciation night on the 30th and this morning when I hear what the uh, medical uh, of health is recommending right. and the mayor and, and rightly so I support what they're doing totally. but 
you know, we may have to cancel that event because right. people are not going to want to come, or and maybe they shouldn't come. Right. But getting back to the younger generation, I, I really would like to see that we do. You know, uh, when I was younger, they used to have all these volunteers at the hospital, young kids that would go to the hospital and work uh, candy stripers, they call them. Right. Well, now you don't see too much of that anymore, and they're busy. The phone's almost made a lot of people, sometimes, like not everybody, but the younger generation, we get selfish, right? Because we're trying to, to go out there. And I, the funny thing I try to tell people is that if you go volunteer, you get involved in the community, you meet great people, right? number one, right? It's a lot of fun, too. You can have fun. You network. And then the best part about it, too, is that if you're down, if you're not feeling good, that can it'll motivate you. It kind of gets you excited. So what's the, you know, we talk about mental health before. And if somebody's not feeling good, it's like, well, what are some ways to get you out of that pattern? And, and I always tell people, like, go... Go help somebody in need, or go 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 yeah. somewhere and change your perspective. Yeah. Go to the hospital, maybe talk to someone that yeah. needs, you know, that they want to talk to. Things like that. Yeah. We're not doing it enough in in that way. Um, I wanted to transition off of that. You got me thinking now about about trying to give back. What would you recommend then on that point? So for the younger kids, like how do they get involved to to give back? Like well, what do you think? I, what I've said at the inner city home, we uh, we have to get into the schools. And, and do some promotion in the schools and convince, like, I think I'd like to see us adopt a, a couple of schools and, and they adopt us. Right. And then once they start to come and see these things, like I, I'm on the Salvation Army board too. And, you know, when I brought my two daughters there, they were young to serve the Christmas feast, they called it, where people in need came for Christmas dinner. When my daughters went that first time to serve, they were just stunned to see how many people were hungry. Wow. And I remember my younger daughter saying, oh, we don't need all those Christmas presents and we don't need this or that. They're so lucky they have everything and these people are really struggling. So I think if we could adopt schools, get them involved coming into the building and us going to their building and, and working together, and they realize, my, there's another world here and we should be a part of it. And I think you'll, you know, it'll spread and you'll get kids becoming volunteers it's very important that you get the help and you can't you know you can't afford to pay you just can't afford to pay so you need people that are willing to sacrifice it costs money to be a volunteer sure. i won't kid you right. it costs money like you know you, you, you go to the today we need something at the hardware i go buy it i pay right. for it you got to pay yeah. yeah and i mean i'm not begrudging it but it costs money to be a volunteer. Your cars always be... I remember driving kids to hockey practice. Right. I had a brand new convertible, and the first right. week I had it, the guy's skate went through my seat. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So he'd say, oh, my yeah. God, what am I doing this for? But, right. but, you know, that's the way it goes. What do you Would you say, like, so here's actually on that point, again, being a teacher, too, and working with all these hockey players, students, things like that, do you think our education system's outdated a little bit? Like, the whole system of how it's set up? So, like... Where, uh, for example, I went to university too, and you can join different groups and things, and then in school. But do you, do you think you're not maybe engaging enough? Like like the systems, I find it's a little bit outdated sometimes. The way we learn, and everyone's on a phone now, so it's different. Yeah. Well, I, I totally agree with you, and I think that uh, this virtual learning, to me, has been a curse for kids. I I have two granddaughters now at Western, and they're they're just a number. Terrible. The, yeah. My youngest one there, she wanted to talk to a counselor. Uh, she's told you have to make an appointment, and the appointment will be 10 minutes long. Uh, yeah. That's not the way it goes. And they're paying to go to school. Yeah, and <laughs> you know? these kids, you know, they were not prepared the way they should have been because the virtual learning, in, in a lot of cases, I thought kids were not learning at all, and they were not participating. And homeschooling, you know, I have, I have a lot of friends that like to dump on teachers and say, right. oh, you got a great job and you got a great pension. Right. But they're learning now what it's like to be a teacher teaching their own children right. and it's it's not easy totally yeah so yeah i i think the education system has to change it has to be more personal and i think it has to be, get rid of cell phones and stuff in the classroom I, totally kids kids are, i've visited schools where one kid is talking to another kid the third row over on the on the Text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Engaged, and then yeah. they're not paying attention. Yeah. I noticed that university, even from an, a different level, where I'm sitting there, I'm in my class. Everybody's on a laptop. I was the only guy that always went in. I learned learned it from this lawyer in the city. His name's Dr. Dale Braun. Really great teacher. One of the, left a real mark on, on me and students. I would show up to class. I always had my pen and paper because I was like everybody else. You know, they're stuck on the laptop, distracted, getting yeah, whatever dings. 
And that's actually what got me into marketing was because of that. I'm like, everyone's on this phone. There's got to be something yeah, there. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, so in terms of that, so the education system, you know, David, I actually want to transition off that because I wanted to be a lawyer in my career too. You almost went down that road as yeah, well. Yeah. Can you talk us, talk us about that? I just think it's an interesting story. Well, I had a d degree in business administration and my wife always, we were just going to get married. She said, I don't know why you want to be a teacher because... You're not cut out to be a teacher. You're more cut out to be in the business world. And she was a teacher. She taught a year before I graduated. And I, I thought probably I didn't pursue it because of my coach convincing me to come to Sturgeon Falls for a year. He said, just come for a year and get the, help me get the programs going. And actually, I wasn't. Four other guys that he had coached came to that school as well. So okay. we were like a, a little group of old friends. You know? Yeah. But... Uh, I started to coach, and I got into guidance my first year, and the second year I was going to leave, he said, what, what would it take to keep you here? I said, well, I don't tell you the truth. I don't enjoy the classroom because right. every 30 minutes you're, the bell rings and you're running to another room. Right. And I said, I'd, I'd, if I stayed in education, I wouldn't mind being in the guidance department. So he put me full-time guidance. No kidding. And the following year, I, I became a department head of guidance, and so I, I loved it. I was dealing with kids and families, and I was coaching hockey. So I thought, hey, this isn't too bad. Maybe I don't right. need to go to law school. Right. But, and, you know, you made a lot less money and uh, et cetera, but that's not what life's all about, money. Well, it's about, yeah, the fulfillment side of it. No, and, that, and that's another thing I wanted to ask you too. So a lot of the time, this, the new generation we're coming into that the old school mentality we always was, you got to go to school, get your education, get a, you know, a graduate degree, so go to law school or MBA. What would you say to those kids out there right now that are sitting there thinking, well, I don't know if I want to go make that investment. I'm not too sure. I'm not clear. I'm a big believer myself as I say, hey, try to go find a mentor because I'll go try to find. So if I want to be a lawyer, go talk to a lawyer. Go get around that person. See if it, see if that'll help you. Like, what would your advice be to those those students nowadays in this generation to do you got to go to graduate school or should you? Or what, what do you think? Well, you're right on what, I, what I'm thinking with my two granddaughters. I, I said to both of them, you, they both want to be doctors. And I said, the best thing we can do is get you a, a, a volunteer position with, with a doctor. And both totally. of them did for the summer. Excellent. And, you know, my youngest one, she worked for, not work, she volunteered for my family doctor. And she was giving COVID shots and doing this and doing yep. that. And, right. and then going to her first year of university. Wow, great experience. It is. And she can't wait. To come back next summer, he's already told me my last appointment. I hope your granddaughter is going to come back next year. And it's all voluntary, but my God, that's great on her that's resume really too. Eh? Totally. And, and, and then they get to know that uh, maybe this is not what I want, or maybe it is what I want. But the, a placement like that is wonderful, and I, and I encourage every kid. You know, now in the schools they have to put so many hours in of community service, and they should. Try to get the community service in areas that are of interest that they like to investigate and pursue as a, a possible career. And, totally. you know, it's good to know what not to do as well as what to do. Totally. No, and it's good. Then you don't have to waste those years That's saying, right. well, all yeah. of a sudden you go get the education. It's not for you. Uh, right off of that point, so this is good. So that, so we're talking about different options and careers and stuff. What would your advice be to somebody looking to start a business? Because, I mean, you've done a lot of business around the community and all over the place. So what would your advice be on that side? Well, the one thing I learned in hockey is if you're in business, you better be the majority shareholder. Right, right, <laughs> yeah, know? I like because that. Because you can have a lot of problems with partners. Yeah. I, I think business is a tough go. Big time. And and it's if you want to be successful, you better be prepared for a lot of work, a lot of hours, and a lot of commitment. Totally. And, you know, I, I look at guys that I know that own restaurants. You better be there because... <laughs> so the guy behind up. the counter is probably <laughs> pouring drinks out of his own bottle. So yeah. you got to be sure that things are going well. It, it's I don't know. Uh, I I enjoyed my uh, business relationships because there were things that I wanted to do. You know, totally. but it's a uh, it's a tough go, and I I really don't know if it's always better. Like I I know some people who say you know I used to have a business. But now I'm working for someone, and I, and I don't have to worry about bills, and I don't have to worry. And now in COVID, geez, I don't know if I'd want to be in business. I feel for these guys and gals, wow. because my God, they're 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 not going to recover a lot of them. They're no. going to be done. You know, no. it's just too too tough. And the the people everywhere you go, we're hiring. 
everywhere. Bring your resume in. I just saw a sign driving here. Bring your resume in. We're we'll, hiring all positions. On the spot, too. Yeah. We yeah. work with Spark Employment Services. Spark, uh, they're, they're, again, they help yeah. you know, facilitate different uh, impl- or staffing, staffing for workers as well as workplaces. It's the same thing right now because it's served that everybody doesn't want to go back to work. They're just collecting that. Yeah. And then it's that, and then obviously the scares with COVID, things like that, but it, it's insane. Well, I was talking to an accountant yesterday at lunch, and he said that their firm, people don't want to go back to work. They want to stay at home and work from home. Right. So, so what does that mean? Buildings are going to be vacant. Totally. It's already coming up. You yeah. see it everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people are working from home. There's no socializing with, with your colleagues or, or friendships. Uh, you could be working in a company and never never meet the person that's, that's your colleague. Right. You know, that's sad. It's not good for mental health, too. No, not at all. How do you, do you have any advice for that side of it, too, so that we are in this generation? Obviously, there's been businesses impacted. We get the call all the time where the, the business might have to pull the plug. You're like, can you save it from the marketing standpoint to get them more business? And I've had to make that decision and say, I'm going to be totally quite honest. I don't know uh, at this point if you're going to be able to do it. Like, we'll, we'll give it our last kind of uh, effort for it, but you see a lot of struggle with that. Um, going to, again, so with that side of it, so, so obviously COVID's, hurting businesses than the mental health aspect something i want to touch on with you is do you have any advice for anybody struggling with their mental health i mean you've been around hockey players and tons of people you know on that side of it anyone struggling what would your advice be to those people if they're suffering mentally well you know before i came here i went to the inner city home and a fellow that i've known for a long time is coming down the steps and i said oh you're volunteering here he said no i'm taking a course right i said what, what course are you take self-esteem and I said, jokingly, I said, God, I know you for a long time. You don't need it. He said, if you know what I'm going through, I need it badly. Right. So, you know, they're struggling. I saw a, a lady the other day at the home that she was just so destroyed. She said, I, I can't exist. If you guys don't feed me and somebody doesn't put a roof over my head, I, I can't exist. Right. So uh, they don't, how do they recover? When you go by Memorial Park, what are those people going to do in the winter? That's they're going to die in those tents. You can't sleep outside. Right, yeah. And they're already dying. Two or three of them have already died. Right. And, and, and it's very sad. It is terrible. Yeah, you see the crosses coming up yeah, all around downtown. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's so sad. You know, I didn't even know much about the inner city home either when I first came. And uh, when I was asked to go to their workshop, and, and I went there... And, of course, there's just the board there and a few guests. But then I went to the home as an invite and met some of the people. Right. And, and the kids. That's what gets me, the kids. Yeah. And, you know, when you're trying to raise money and it's for kids, everybody wants to help you. Right. But what really got me was, I, I guess, I probably had a crappy attitude about the guy on the corner panhandling. Right. Thinking, well, why the hell doesn't he get a job? Well, maybe he can't get a job. Maybe he's got a sickness. Maybe he's got a, he's an addict, whatever it is. And you get to have a different perspective on uh, on your feeling about people. And there are a lot of people Tons. that are good people that are in need. And yes, there are some people that play in the role. Take but there's a lot of good people I know play the role and, and are not legitimate. So, you know, there's, there were good teachers, there were bad teachers, there were excellent teachers. And, and it's the way the world is. So you, you have to have to be a little more sensitive about how you feel and how you treat people. And a lot of people now with COVID are going to be in need of help, counseling and, uh, and other That's things. And, and helping them, propping them up to, to gain some self-esteem again. Well, you see it everywhere nowadays too, and it's like it's we have that innate nature to want to judge people for for that. And it's like, well, at the end of the day, you don't know their story, where they came yeah. from, and it's it's we're seeing it more so than ever. I because I, I see a lot of this from the mental health aspect, and I'm looking, I'm like, the numbers are rising with this. People are losing their job, and it's just creating this kind of tumble uh, problems, right? So I'm always looking for for different ways that we can engage and say, okay, maybe maybe this is a way to give back. So how would somebody, for example, like if we want to work with the inner city home where they want to, you know, send or donate or send services over, how do we do that, Joe? Well, if you want to volunteer, and we certainly need volunteers, you just have to call the inner city home. And they're happy. When I left, uh, our ED was on the phone speaking to people That's about great. volunteering. We've opened the new Sudbury site now. That's great. So we need help out there. The people that come to us come from all over the greater city of Sudbury. And so 
we had to open the new Sudbury site because they can't get downtown. They don't have uh, wheels. Right. They don't have bus passes. They don't have transportation of any kind. The other day at the home, I saw a lady with three bags on the floor, and her husband was getting two more bags because you, you get food for individuals. Right. And I said to them, uh, where, where are you going to go now? She said, uh, we're going to walk to our home. Where do you live? Gatchel. They were oh. going to walk from the inner city home to Gatchel, carrying five bags. Yeah. And there's cans in there and heavy foods, you know, but they don't have a chance if somebody doesn't help them. It's true. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think... If we can get people to volunteer, and I'm so pleased, you know, I, I spoke at the Legion one night, and uh, a guy came up to me and says, you know, I, I give a donation every month off my paycheck to a certain organization. He said, I didn't know about the inner city home. I'm going to give my donation there now. He said, would you be willing to come and speak to our union guys? I said, I sure would. And hopefully some of them will decide to take money off their check monthly. It's just a small amount, but every amount, because it adds a up. Amount. Yeah, all adds up, yeah. right? There was a guy walking by the house one day. I was outside with the, the ED, and we were looking at putting signs up on the lawn. And he stopped, and he said, I saw your press release the other night. He said, and I can't volunteer because of my job, but right. I'd like to help you. And he handed us $100. Ever nice. And you know how many people go by that house and drop off 20 bucks, 30 bucks, And, that, you know, every dollar we get buys $3 of food. Right. So we're happy to get cash because we can get more food and help more people. Well, and now it. at the house, we're not just serving cans. Before, you, you didn't have facilities for frozen fruits and frozen meats. and that. Now we have all that. So when you come in today, you'll get your bags of stables. Then you can get eggs, you can get milk, That's you great. Get fresh fruit. And people are very, very pleased that they have some nutrition. Can you give us a breakdown of the inner city home, like the services and things? Just just for anybody out there that might not know exactly what the yeah. inner city home does. Well, we, we offer these programs, and most of the, well, all of the people that are in the programs, they come for nothing. They're referred to by agencies or right. the hospital or the courts. They're sent to take programs, and uh, Bruno Michel coordinates all the programs, and all the teachers in the programs are volunteers. Uh, the wow. self-esteem one today, when I went upstairs after I talked to this gentleman, the, the teacher in there was uh, Jamie Jamison. He's a, a volunteer. He's in the Knights of Columbus with us at uh, Council 6074, St. Andrew the Apostle, and, and he's teaching a course. He said he has seven people in the program, this course, and today he had all seven uh, in attendance. Sometimes someone doesn't show up. Right. But he said... Today, the questions were great, and the people were all involved, Engaged. and it was great. The other thing we do is, of course, we feed needy families, and we feed children. Uh, I was looking at the stats this morning. In 2019, we serviced 12, uh, uh, 1,220 families. Huge. This year, so far, we're servicing 2,220 families and 635 children. Wild. So, you know, it's growing and growing. And we have people that are living in their cars because they can't yeah. afford to have an apartment and they don't have a job. They're losing their insurance on the cars because they can't pay it. So, you know, there's a lot of need out there. And I'm all for feeding the needy and helping children. The children go to school without a lunch? No. Can't do it. We got to get those kids lunches. Well, that's it because then they can't focus because they're right. going to eat. You're, you're, right. you're about food. And you know the nice thing? They're so grateful. I don't hear anybody negative saying, I want to. They're so great. The guy yesterday said, I'm so happy that you people feed us the way you do. And we're happy to feed you the way we do. And we hope that we still get all the big box stores, the local stores, the local businesses. They're giving us so much food and so much money that we can buy food it's that nice. is, they're worse. Today, Bruno said to me, gee, we, we got a real big load of bacon coming in. Right. So give them two bacon. Yeah, yeah, get them excited. Yeah, because yeah. you, know I mean? yeah. you can't keep it. No, no, give exactly. Give them two bacon. Yeah. I was going to ask you on that, Joe. So something I think this generation specifically, I don't know if this was the older generation as well, but they don't practice gratitude, being grateful. A lot of us are ungrateful. We live our lives, and I find one of the best ways to kind of, you sit back and say, wow, I, like we have a roof over our head, all these things. What would your advice be for, for people to start, you know, being more grateful? Is that something you see all the time? It's like, oh, well, I don't have this. I need a new car. I need that. Like, walk me through that a little bit. I use the word entitlement. There it is. Yep. I think there's so many people 
feel that they're entitled and uh, they don't appreciate. And, and I said earlier, they don't know how to say thank you. Or it's true. They don't know how because they don't, they don't do it. You know, as a school principal, I had one thing that I did religiously. Anytime there was a, an activity or an event that anybody in the school or the whole school participated, I'd go home at night and write thank you notes to the whole staff or the group that were in there. And in the morning, I'd go to school early every morning. I'd put them in their mailboxes. That's I had a really teacher nice. tell me not long ago, she hasn't had a thank you note from her principal since I left. That's and, and that's a shame. Because, you know, when you thank them and show appreciation, they'll go through the wall for you. Totally. And they'll do anything. And if, if you're having an activity in the school, the principal doesn't sit in his office. He's out lifting pop cases, Working the greeting people at the door, doing whatever has to be. Oh, we need something down at the grocery store. Everybody's working. You get in your car and go to the grocery right. store and get it for them, you know. But then they say, well, God, if... if the head honcho, so, so to speak, is getting off his rump and participating. Why shouldn't I? You know, when we ran that performing arts program at Sudbury Center, teachers were coming out, they wanted to be a part of it. Right. You know, but myself and the vice principals, the guidance head, we were there for every performance, working, keeping everybody happy. Then the teachers all get, and you know, the morale just goes. Through the roof. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the way it should be, it's, too. You know, I would say... My philosophy in life is you got to work hard, but you have to play hard. And if you don't do both of those together, there's no team. You You're need, right. And I would say there's no I. And Tom Rennie taught me that at Hot Camp. There's no I in the word team. All right. Yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. Uh, right off of that, Joe, so this is an important question. So, so because you've done so many things, if you were to talk to your younger self, going back, so let's go back, you know, 30 years, what would you tell that person? If you were, to, if you had any any pieces of advice or golden nuggets, things that you've learned in your life that you could offer to other people that you remember. Well, just in my own case, I think if I hadn't had good mentors, I probably would not have done the things that I did, or even ventured into the areas that I ventured into. My first job as a principal was because of my high school hockey coach. Right, I became a principal. I remember. When I was appointed principal, he took me golfing. We never got off the first hole. We sat on the bench, and he gave me the best advice I ever had. He said, your role is to make sure that everybody's happy and everybody knows what's best for your institution. And he said, I'm going to tell you the key to success. When you work with people, and it, especially your superiors, keep a book, and in the book, the left page says things to do, and the right is things not to do that you see that person who supervises you, how he operates. I still have a book like that. Wild. And, you know, you learn a lot of good things that, hey, that's a good trait. I should be doing that. But that's not the way you treat people on the other page, and that's not the way you, you should handle a situation like this on the other page. And, and, you know, that's a good way to make yourself successful. I like that. No, I think that's really good. And actually, like that's something I should practice more. I always take notes too when I'm seeing certain things. Like yeah. say you don't forget and remember. But I like that. Right off of that question is, what what do you think in your mind makes a great leader? Because you've seen tons across the board. Like what, what makes a great leader? Well, I think what makes a great leader is that people believe that you are legitimate. I've said that word so many times because mm -hmm. it's a word that I think is so important. There are so many people... Uh, I hated people that came to me and said, oh, God, I love your tight. And you know they don't. I call it sucking, sucking around, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. I think people want to believe you're you. And, and the one compliment I've always had thrown at me is, you say it as it is and there's no BS from you. So we, and I and I like that because I like, if you think I'm a jerk, tell me. It doesn't mean we're not going to talk again, but... Let's be honest with each other and not phony. Totally. You know? It gets nowhere, too, and there's no transparency. And it's uh, Carl Jung, that old philosopher, used to say, he's like, it's, uh, you see, it's their mask, right? And then you'll slowly start to see the mask kind of crack or, or come off, right? I'll give you an example. Like, uh, like you see some people probably in society, where they'll be really nice to you, and then all of a sudden you're at a restaurant, they treat the waiter yeah. not that well, right? Certain things like that. Connor, I've been carrying the, this book since I became a principal. And if you see, all I have in it is all sayings and, and 
things that yeah. I, I want to remember. Right, I'll let you know. You know. And, and here's one from Henry Ford. I use it all the time. Coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. So those kinds of things, when I speak, I throw these quotes in. I like because that. Because they, they really are. And I got pages and pages. Yeah, of yeah. <laughs> who, you, who was uh, somebody growing up that really inspired you? Maybe. Well, my, uh, my, uh, th my coach. The coach. Yeah, you know, I did the eulogy at his funeral, and uh, he was my mentor. Uh, I couldn't even call him by his first name all my life because I had so much respect for him. And uh, he, he told me one time, he said, you've got a lot of good qualities. He said, you can be anything you want to be and go after it. Big time. You know, and he ended up, I lived right next door to him, and uh, he, he was really somebody that I respected and appreciated very much. That's a, it, you know, that's incredible. I, I think it's wonderful to have a mentor. We're, well, one of my last questions for that, so some people too, they might not be able to find mentors. So what would your advice be to go find a mentor? Just go in the public and... Well, I, I think you, you you talk to people you know who, who might reference somebody to you. You know, I don't think you just go in the public and take anybody. Like you, you might have an uncle or a friend or an Lots associate mentors, yeah. and say, geez, you know, I, I'd like to get some information on this topic or whatever it is and he said well I know a guy that might be good for you why don't we touch base with him and see if he, he's the one that could be a mentor I, w I was uh, I had a little brother when I played hockey at Clarkson and spent a lot of time with him we still stay in touch he lives in Massachusetts so I live in Sudbury but with technology you can Keep zoom and you can do whatever you want and, and talk to each other but it's important that you have somebody that you can feel comfortable with and that you can bounce things off there you know you might think you, you know everything, but you don't. And, oh, sure. so, and you, a lot of times, I used to take, before I lose my cool on, a, on an issue, I, I'd want to sleep on it for the night. Smart. And then get up in the morning and reread it and make sure that, yeah, are you sure you want to send this out? Right. Are yeah, you sure you want to say this? And maybe, oh, I better call my mentor and see what, what he or she thinks about this. Right. No, I really like that too. So it's, that's actually really good advice on that side of it too, because then you get a fresh, fresh set of or a, a fresh day, so you yeah. can think about it a little bit. Like even after this call, I have a, I have a life coach I deal with, like uh, specifically just for you know trying to help me kind of get focused on some things. So like that, that's my coach on that end, because you look at like any any great players or anywhere they always have a coach. Yeah. So I took that from from Tony Robbins actually. Yes. The one Tony was the one he said you know or when I was at one of his seminars. He said, after this, make sure you go get someone that keeps you accountable and a, and a coach. So I always throw things at him and we get a good relationship. And the biggest thing he actually said to me too, he's like, make sure you can vibe properly. Okay, so it's you guys are on the same level. Not on the same level, but the same wavelength. So you, you, you have a good kind of back and forth. But you know, this coaching has become very big now. There was a time when no one even knew what. Should it, what, right. what does a coach do? Right. Does he coach the hockey team or the football team? But, right. but now it's very important. Coaches are, are critical. Big time. Yeah. I do with a lot of the younger generation. Like I try to bring them up. I used to go teach in the schools and I, I, I just try to get them focused. I'm not in here to try to motivate them, get them kind of clear because I think there was a lack of direction sometimes where you're like, oh, your parents are pushing you one direction, but you're inspired over here and those type of things. One of the closing ones I want to ask you, this is a good one too, do you have any books that you recommend to the audience out there that have you know, left a significant impact on your life? Well, I'm, I'm reading a book now that uh, a lady gave me. It's, it's really, her name is Louise Hay, the author. Have you heard of that one? I'm not too sure, and no. Each day of the week, she has a page with a message on it. Right. So that's, I'm, I'm really concentrating on that, and I'm, I, she gave me this book, I guess it was February, and I've been reading a page every day, and there's so much in there that really makes sense and hits you right between the eyes. And most of the time, I read that page a couple of times. Right. And she often says in the page, "Go to a mirror, look in the mirror, and, and say this to yourself as you look in the mirror." And boy, do you ever think about things? It's true. So, but I've been so busy that I haven't been reading. But I'm a big guy to read uh, magazines. I love sports magazines. Right. I, I read those. And uh, I love movies. What are the last questions? So to close this off, Joe, so first and foremost, uh, 
I just want to say I consider you kind of a mentor of mine in, in a lot of ways too, from a lot of things I've learned, um, and just watch, being able to watch you too. And, and Joe, you've, you've been very helpful in my life. I needed something too, and for an event, you're like, oh, call this person. He'd yeah. send me over like that, and I, I have nothing but respect for that. Not not many people nowadays, right? They know how to. They won't go out of their way for stuff like that. Well, so. you know, uh, Corey Hershey, he, he's so appreciative that you had him. Uh, and I see he's got a big job now in the, in the NHL. He's uh, he's doing the uh, Seattle broadcast. That's great, too. Yeah, so, but he was pleased that uh, we called him and you got him on your podcast. And the thing is with those guys like that, too, they're just real. Even like yeah. Theo Fleury, like getting to, I'd be, I built yeah. a good relationship with him after. Well, you know, I, I didn't know him, but after dealing with you and going on those sites... I was really totally impressed with him. He really, really real deal. They're, they're very raw too. When yeah. I talked to him, spiritual, and yeah. it, it was interesting at first when I first interviewed him. I, you get a different kind of feeling for people too, right? And uh, just, just the way he was, and I could just you felt a good vibe off him. Like he's done it, and he knows. And he's like, well, you know, don't oh, yeah, stay in your head. Yeah, it's like yeah. get outside. Well, the, the other thing that was nice about your uh, was that you had a real variety of people. They, they weren't all ho hockey players and jocks, you know? No, for sure. Very, very good. I enjoyed that very much. I appreciate it. We're going to do another one, too. I'd like to do one live, like in yeah, person. Yeah, that would that, be good. It'd be nice, like, to, it's the only thing is coordinating with everybody. Yeah. And I would maybe, think, maybe do one live at, the, like, a Caruso Club mm -hmm. or something, you know? And yeah. Yeah, I think it'd fill the place. I think it'd be really good. I think people need it. So, And I wasn't, I wasn't expecting it to go where it did, like, mm -hmm. really into that dark place to really showcase to people. We had a lot of feedback from it at the end. Well, one of the best guys I've ever worked with is Tom Rennie, right. the CEO of Hockey Canada. And, you know, he'd be willing to come here anytime and uh, help us out with a, an event. We'd love it. To, I'd love yeah, to do it. We'll no. do one. We're, we're past due on that one, too, yeah. Joe. Well, Tom's a, he's a first-rate guy. I love to hear that, yeah, too. Yeah. No, and for, well, first and foremost, I just want to say, Joe, thank you for coming on my show this afternoon, too. Juan, as you've done a phenomenal job in your career. Again, you're somebody I look up to and just... The way you work the room, that's uh, that, that's something I, no, and I say that in a good way, I, li I like that, the way you're able to go and you move, and I, th that's always been something that inspires me to, to go out in the public and be able to give back. Uh, and are, do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to close off with? No, well, I'm, I was very happy to have a chance to sit down. I guess I, I rambled a lot, but no, uh, no. It's, it's nice to, to reminisce and to talk and uh, to throw out your feelings, and I appreciate, uh, I really want to tell you, Honestly, how much I appreciate what you do for the inner city home, because we could not survive financially without the things you do for us. Honestly, I appreciate it. I'm glad we connected too. I'm glad that we're able to give back on that, and it's it's like uh, like you said, it's when you can help, you help, right? And uh, that, that's always been something, and it's to find the groups and, and get to work with you guys and your great board. I, I you know we can't thank you guys enough too to allow us to, to help you guys out as we can. Stay tuned, guys. Actually, we have a, a really nice video going to be coming out, which you're in the show, too. So I'll send that to you this week. But no, thank you for everything, and, and we're very appreciative to work with you as well.